this is the cover of a book I wrote a few years ago, and by an astounding coincidence, it has exactly the same title as this evening's talk. <laughs> okay, let's start out with some myths about energy, the first one being that $4 a gallon is too much to pay for gasoline. $4 a gallon is about a dollar a liter. We pay nearly twice that much for bottled drinking water. The fact is that at $4 a gallon, uh, gasoline, more or less like milk, is among the cheapest liquids you can buy in the United States, and that's a big part of the problem. Oil companies produce oil. At least they say they produce oil. They talk about production, rate of production, and so on. In fact, oil was produced by the sun and the earth over 100 million years. No oil company has ever produced a drop of oil. They simply uh, extract it and sell it, and that's why it's so cheap. We must conserve energy, otherwise there'll be an energy crisis. The law of conservation of energy is one of the deepest laws in all of physics. Energy is always conserved no matter what we do. Uh, we don't need to conserve energy. There are things we need to conserve, however, and they're called fuel. When we run out of oil, <clears throat> the marketplace will ensure that it's replaced by something else. We will look carefully at that argument in the course of this evening's talk. If there's enough fossil fuel in the ground to last for 100 years, we will look carefully at that as well uh, during, during this talk. Nuclear energy is dangerous. <clears throat> most technically trained people understand that nuclear energy is the safest, most reliable form of energy we have, but it won't replace oil. And I'll tell you more about that later. The greenhouse effect is in global warming are bad. I will argue that without the greenhouse effect in global warming, we would not be alive. So let's start with a brief history of, uh, of energy. <clears throat> the same energy that uh, Dr. Ellis talked about. Uh, during the 18th century, there was something called caloric. Uh, it was a precise uh, mathematical theory. Uh, if you knew how much caloric there was in a hot piece of copper and put it into a cool pan of water, you could calculate how much caloric would run out of the copper into the water and predict with, with confidence the temperature at which the two would come to equilibrium. So it was, it was a, a, an exact theory. But there were those who didn't believe in it, and one of them was Count Rumford. Uh, Count Rumford was born Benjamin Thompson in New Hampshire in 1753, uh, and he, he's most famous for a paper he wrote uh, about drilling out of cannon barrels. He said that dr drilling out of cannon barrels seems to create an awful lot of caloric when none existed before, and that should not be possible according to the caloric theory. So he doubted the caloric theory. Um, he even tried to figure out how much mechanical action substituted for a given amount of heat, but he failed to do it. During the next 50 years or so, until the time of James Prescott Joule, the law of conservation of energy was discovered at least nine separate times. When something like that happens, the credit for making the discovery goes not to the person who discovered it first, but to the person who discovered it last, because he discovered it so well that it never had to be discovered again. And that was James Prescott Joule. Joule did an experiment in which he had four pound weights descending through 16 feet and driving a, a paddle wheel in a bucket of water. Uh, and at the end of, after 16 of these uh, weights had descended, he made careful measurements of the temperature of the water. And he reported to the Royal Society of London that the uh, amount of heat required to raise one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit was equivalent to the amount of work required to lift 800 pounds through one foot. And that constituted the, law, the discovery of the law of conservation of energy. Uh, there are various forms of energy. Energy comes in, uh, you may not be able to see it as, as Dr. Ellis said, but it comes in various forms. Uh, one form is kinetic energy, the energy of motion. A uh, car moving down the, the road or a bowling ball rolling down the alley each have kinetic energy just simply because they're in motion. But the atoms and molecules that make up the bowling ball and make up the car also have kinetic energy. They are in random motion, and their kinetic energy is directly proportional to their temperature, or I should say their temperature is directly proportional to their kinetic energy. So when something gets hotter, it just means its atoms are moving around faster. There is also potential energy. Potential energy can be gravitational, as in the, the weights that, uh, that, that James Prescott Joule endowed with potential energy when he lifted them 16 feet above the ground. Uh, the, the, there is gravitational potential energy, chemical potential energy, nuclear poten potential energy, and so on. There's one more form of energy that's important for our story, and that is thermal energy. Uh, 
radi radiant energy, the form in which energy reaches us from the sun over 93 million miles of practically nothing whatsoever. On this plot, the vertical scale is intensity, and the horizontal scale is frequency, and it goes from radio waves at long wavelengths, low frequencies, through the infrared, uh, through a very narrow band of, of light that we can actually see, visible from red to yellow to blue, and then beyond that, the ultraviolet and X-rays and gamma rays. Every, everybody radiates at all temperatures. Uh, the lowest curve is a rather cool body. It might be the temperature of your own body. Uh, it starts out and at zero, rises to a maximum in the infrared, and falls back down to zero before it reaches the visible. You don't glow in the dark because you're just too cool. Uh, the next highest curve is, represents something like an ember in the fireplace. Uh, it falls down, it also peaks in the infrared, but it falls down through the visible, being highest at the red end, and therefore it looks red to our eyes. It might be the temperature of an ember uh, glowing in the fireplace. The upper curve is the, the sun. The sun has a maximum right near the visible. By no accident whatsoever, we, our eyes evolved to be most sensitive to the colors uh, of, of light from the sun as it reflects off the things around us. So knowing that, we can talk about the Sun-Earth system. The sun uh, is white hot, uh, radiates energy at five or 6,000 kelvins, that, that is degrees kelvin. Uh, 93 million miles away, the tiny globe of the Earth intercepts an infinitesimal fraction of that energy. Of the energy that the Earth uh, intercepts, 30% is reflected directly back out into space, and 70% is absorbed by the Earth. The reflected energy can be seen uh, from the Moon in this famous shot of the Earth rise on the Moon in the colors of the continents, the, uh, the oceans, and uh, the polar caps, and so on. Uh, it's a simple calculation to figure out what temperature the Earth would have to be to send the other 70% of it back into space. The 70% of the uh, sun's radiation falls on the Earth and the Earth absorbs it. It has to send exactly that amount back out into space, otherwise it would be warming up continuously, and it's not warming up continuously. And it's a, it's a simple calculation to figure out how much, what temperature the Earth would have to have in order to radiate that amount of energy back out into space. And the answer, is 255 kelvins, or 18 degree, minus 18 degrees Celsius, or zero degrees Fahrenheit. If that were the whole story, if the Earth were really uh, radiating uh, that energy and had a temperature, a mean surface temperature of zero degrees Fahrenheit, I don't think we would be alive. I don't think we would ever have evolved. There are various things that govern the climate of the Earth. One of them is the tilted axis. Uh, the uh, when the Earth is at position A, the axis is tilted towards the sun, and it's summer in the north. When the Earth is at position C, six months later, the axis always tilts in the same direction because the Earth is kind of a gyroscope. Uh, and the south pole is tilted towards the sun, and it's summer in the south. So the tilted axis creates the seasons. Um, the El Nino cycle is particularly interesting. The uh, wind blows across the equatorial Pacific from east to west, uh, sc scooping up surface warmed water as it goes and piles up the water against the Asian continent where it rains and creates the monsoon rain, uh, monsoons that are the characteristic climate of that part of the world. Once every three or four years, for reasons that nobody knows, the, uh, the, the trade winds that are blowing, the, the, uh, the, the blowing across the Pacific slacken the warm water spreads back out across the Pacific, causing droughts in uh, Asia and uh, in Australia, and storms in North and South America, and a huge perturbation of the world's climate system.